and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Hello, Rhonda. Hello, David, and welcome to our listeners. Um, today is we're recording Corona Cast and our third episode of Corona Cast, and we have two really incredibly brilliant guests on our show, Alex. Thank you. Ova and David. <laughs> Alex Clark and Zaina Halim. And Alex and Zaina, I'm gonna just invite you to introduce yourselves. Alex and Zaina. Go ahead, Alex. Oh, great. Well, my name is Alex Clark. I am a psychiatrist in private practice and um, psychotherapy is, is a huge part of my practice and I'm excited to be here today. And uh, I, I might say a certified team therapist and one of the teachers in our Tuesday training group at Stanford. Um, Zaina? Yes, I'm Zaina Halim, and I um, am an associate marriage and family therapist. Um, I work out of a private practice in Menlo Park, and I also um, do online business coaching where I combine teen CBT and Buddhist business practices. So I work with business owners and entrepreneurs. And um, in your business coaching practice, uh, you're focusing not so much on bringing people from depression out of depression, but taking people who are already functioning well and helping them jump to a higher level of, of peak performance. And then yes. in your uh, regular therapy work, you're using team therapy for depression and anxiety and whatever for individuals 16 years of age and, and older. And so we're really uh, so happy to have you uh, here tonight. But before we, we get started, just a couple quick things. First, I want to say that uh, I haven't been promoting the upcoming workshops because I haven't known what was going to happen. But I'm, I'm sure the next one that I do with uh, Jill Levitt, I think it's in, is it May 7th or May 17th? May 17th, May 17th uh, the Cognitive Distortion Toolkit. That, that's going to be a killer workshop. And we will probably have to eliminate the in-person part of it. It, it. That workshop, my workshops with Jill are always on Sunday. And some people, 40, can come in person. And the rest are online. And for this one, we'll probably have to have it entirely online, but it, it, it's going to be a great workshop. So I hope you can, can join us uh, there. Just a word about online training. The online training is still really awesome. You see everyone, you hear everything. We still break up into small groups. You get a lot of individual attention. So, you know, it's not, it's not exactly, of course, as intimate as in person, but it's still, an, you know, a great experience. Yeah, and we'll have probably at least 10 helpers, if not more, to help those of you who attend online, who, who will be coaching you in the breakout rooms and the practice sessions. So, uh, and we have people who are you now are really experienced at doing that. Uh, second thing is that we, we get these beautiful endorsements from you folks and kindly, lovely letters. It's it's so heartwarming. Here, here's two we got just today. Hi, David, Rhonda, Alex, and Jeremy. I hope my email finds you well and that I'm not interrupting what must be an incredibly busy time for you. I'm sitting at home holding my four month old son with tears in my eyes as I listen to your beautiful Corona Cast episode one. What an amazing, generous, and loving thing you are doing for the community of Feeling Good podcast listeners. I'm just blown away by how profound this podcast is. I feel so grateful to have team in my life and to be able to learn such a beautiful way of being a therapist. All four of you have been a blessing in my life and I've learned tremendously from you. I hope you're holding up well during our bizarre current events and that you can take satisfaction and motivation 
from how much the work you do is making a positive difference in the world with love and gratitude, Kevin Cornelius. And Kevin is, is you're one of our favorite people too, Kevin. And Kevin uh, attended our Tuesday training group for, for quite a while and, and he's both humble and a brilliant psychotherapy star. And now he's practicing so he can get all of his certification hours at the Feeling Good Institute, Mountain View, California. And he's in the low fee clinic. And, and so if any of you are looking for low fees, uh, because people charge a lot in this area and his fee is, is $95 an hour, which isn't nothing, but it's a fraction of what most other people are charging. And he is an absolute genius and he's got a heart, heart of gold. And I would recommend anybody uh, to Kevin for, for therapy. And here's another one from uh, Jesper. And uh, he, this was directed to, to Rhonda, actually. Uh, thank you so much, Rhonda, for your kind reply and explanation. And you were right. Now it works in, in my browser as well as my app. We had some trouble with, the, with the, the podcast being published today, and Rhonda scrambled and other people scrambled and got it taken care of, which was a relief to me also. But I'm looking forward to listening to today's podcast. As always, the Feeling Good podcast is by far the be best podcast I have ever discovered. Wow, that is so kind. Thank you for that, uh, Jesper. And now we'll, we'll dive in. We've had a couple podcasts so far on negative thoughts and feelings, depression and anxiety, looking at how we feel as individuals panicked and and threatened and anxious by these these threatening and very real events uh, the, these days and the, the sudden uh, transformation of, of, of our lives. Uh, but another way that we can get uh, hurt by the uh, podcast is in terms of our relationships with others. And I think there's more uh, like boiling points, people are cooped up uh, with, with one another more, and and sometimes we can get angry and and upset. I had a, a run in with, with with my son yesterday, and uh, it, it was it got got kind of ugly, and uh, you know I felt terrible about it, and uh, and 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 I couldn't make my five secrets work, and then he was sitting at his computer, and I remember touch, and I went up and started massaging his shoulders, and he just melted. And, and then I just started hugging him. He was working with a colleague on, on his computer on a live Zoom session, and then we hugged, and we, we feel so much, I think, closer than we've, we've ever felt. But uh, these things happen, and we've seen in our Tuesday group last week, I won't mention any details, but one of our therapists was having a, a severe run-in with, with one of her children, you know, being in the house, and all these additional responsibilities people have and, and fears that they have. And so we thought it would be really, really great to, t to talk for, for at least one session on how, how we can get upset with loved ones d during this coronavirus period, particularly when, when you're, you're trying to help a loved one and, and you get worried about them and, and then they start re resisting your, your efforts. And uh, two, two, a week ago Tuesday, Zaina, gave us such a beautiful example of that and uh, it, it brought tears to your eyes. And uh, so many of us felt so close to you, Zaina. What, what you did was absolutely beautiful. And I, I, I thought it would be great to invite you to, to share what happened that Tuesday night and what, what, what you'd been encountering and what you learned that night. And then when you took it out of the the training in, into the real world kind of kind of what ha happened. So I'll let you go ahead and, 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 and put it in your own words. And Alex, who was there that night, uh, were you there also, Rhonda? No, I wasn't there. Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll ask a Alex to kind of uh, chime in too and uh, help, help bring that, this wonderful message to, to life. Yeah. So would it be helpful if someone did a a quick intro to forced empathy before sure. I? Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, you want to describe it, Alex? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. 
So this is one of uh, the myths, David, that you, um, you know. Your voice is getting real warbly. How about now? Is that any it's better? It's great now. It's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, yeah, this is just one of the techniques so that you No, you're breaking up. And... You're breaking up. I'll describe the technique. Maybe you can reconnect your connection or, or something like that. You're, it was just all, all, all broken up. Uh, forced empathy is a technique that I created probably 30 years ago. And I felt like there wouldn't be much interest in it. And so I never pushed it very much. And it, it, it really worked like magic half the time and half the time it failed. And I, it took me a while to figure out why it worked and why it didn't work. But what it is, it, it is actually, um, you might say a Buddhist technique or it's a Christian technique. It's a Jewish technique. It's a probably a, you know, it's an Islamic technique. It's a Hindu technique. It's a Taoist technique. Are there any other religions? <laughs> it's, it's inherently a spiritual technique, but it's a practical technique when you're in conflict with somebody. And it, the assumption of, of the technique working is that you want to develop a better and more loving relationship with the person. Because if you're ticked off at someone and blaming them and kind of fighting with them and wanting to stay in the role of victim and wanting to keep blaming them and looking down on them and arguing with them, then this technique is, isn't for you. This technique is only for people who want a more loving relationship. But it's, it's based on, on the idea that when we get in conflict with someone, we tend to use the distortions and project them onto the other person. So we'll label them as a selfish person or a, a control freak, or we'll say they, they never listen. They, they shouldn't feel the way they, they, they feel. They've got no right to, to say that. They've got no right to think that, that way. And then we get annoyed with them and we, the way we interact with them actually <clears throat> becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They start to act in just the negative way that, that we think that, that they really are. But what's happening is, is that you're usually not really seeing the world from the other person's point of view. You're, you're interpreting their motives in, in your own distorted way, and that's what makes you so, so ticked off. When you use forced, em forced empathy, we actually force the patient to see the world through the eyes of the person that he or she is angry with. And it's, it's really a, 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 a cool technique because it sometimes causes a sudden shift of, in your understanding of why the other person is acting the way that they're acting. And this can be profoundly moving and, and suddenly bring about a whole new and different spirit in the way you inter interact with, 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 that, with that person. Why don't you describe the conflict you were having with your mother, and we can talk about this issue, and then we'll 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 talk about the details of how we did the the forced empathy, and you can describe what that was like for you, Zena. Okay, great. So, the conflict that I was having with my mother this was several weeks ago before the shelter in place order had taken effect. So it was really just the very beginning of starting to see coronavirus cases in in the Bay Area. And um, I was quite worried. Uh, my mom is 74, so given her age, she is in a high-risk category. And I was quite worried um, about my mom's health. And I was wanting her to be very, very careful, even though there hadn't been any <clears throat> you know, public instructions as to how careful we needed to be. Um, and so I felt, I felt angry with her. I felt like she was being irresponsible. And so we were, <clears throat> excuse me, we were having a conflict that I was wanting to kind of pressure her to take more extreme measures in terms of protecting her health and trying to not contract the coronavirus. And she thought she was being, you know, careful enough. And so that's where I was feeling kind of angry and wanting to be able to get her to act in a way that I thought was more appropriate, even though I really was on the more extreme end um, at that point in time in terms of what I thought was being careful enough. Yeah, uh, great. And, and how did that feel to be in conflict with your mother? Because when you pressured her, 
to be more careful, how did she respond? <laughs> she didn't appreciate that. Um, she, I mean, I was feeling both angry and worried and sad. And I think she was probably feeling frustrated and, you know, I, maybe a bit like I was sort of insulting her intelligence as if she couldn't make these types of decisions for herself. Yeah, sure. Uh, absolutely. Like, mom, please, please don't uh, uh, get in the way of Corona people who were sneezing <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and she gets annoyed at being told what to, to do. Right, um, exactly. Now, the way forced empathy works, it's, it's, it's really a kind of a super sophisticated technique. And there, there's many, many ways of doing it. We can replicate it a little bit right, right now, even though you already did it that night. And there's many ways to do it. But, but, but one way to do it is, is, is called, you know, the, the stranger on the bus. And, and you, what I would say to you, Zaina, if I was doing this technique right now, I'd like to use a technique called uh, forced empathy to see if we can help you see the world a little bit better through, through your mother's eyes. And, and let's just do a make-believe technique called a stranger on a bus. And let's imagine we're sitting together on a bus, but you don't know me and I, I don't know you. Uh, and, and then we, we start talking about this conflict that, that you're having with your mother. And you have to play the role of your mother. And then I'm going to kind of cross-examine you and say, you know, how, how do you feel when, when, when your daughter uh, tries to tell you what to do about the coronavirus? And is it true that you're upset with your daughter and that there's a conflict going on? And how do you think and feel about it? And there are several rules. Uh, like one, we can say, let's imagine that, that you've just taken a dose of intravenous truth serum. And so you have to agree to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So you're, you're playing your mother, and I'm a stranger on the bus who's, who's talking to your mother. Uh, secondly, you're not allowed to rationalize or, or to deny anything. Um, and the third rule is you have to agree to speak as best as you can for your conscious and subconscious mind. And and so, let let's uh, let, let 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 let's see how how it goes, and 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 so um, well, let's give your mother a name, not her real name. Okay. So, what um, call her? How about Miriam? Ma Miriam. Okay. Um, so Miriam, apparently, uh, there there's a conflict going on between you and your daughter Zaina. Is 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 that true? Yes, that's correct. Uh huh. What what what's happening between the two of you? Because it, it seems like she's a real loving daughter, and you're a real loving mother. And but are are you kind of frustrated and ticked off at her? Is there some tension right now? Yes, definitely. I think you know she's well intentioned, and she she's worried about my health, and you know that I'm 74 and I'm high risk, and the whole coronavirus thing, but even though she's well-intentioned, she's coming off as kind of being very controlling and trying to tell me that I'm not being careful enough. And she, you know, what she's suggesting, I think, is far too extreme and not really necessary in terms of the amount of caution that I need to be taking right now. Yeah, well, I know she's a very uh, loving uh, daughter and, and and a really neat person, but it sounds like she's being kind of controlling and, and far too extreme and kind of pressuring you a lot. Yes, that's exactly right. How does that make you feel? Well, it really doesn't make me feel very good. I mean, I know she's concerned, but it's just too much, you know, it's it's sort of insulting to my intelligence and you know my independence and um it's just sort of taking over it's taking over our relationship it's like all we talk about lately wow uh, wow um 
That, that doesn't sound like much fun when there's so much tension in the air and so much fear in the air to be having this, this tense adversarial interaction with, with, with your daughter. And feel free to jump in here, Alex. Yeah, great. Hopefully my connection's a little bit better, but- Sounds um, good now. It, it does. It does seem like um, Zaina has been and been pushing you in in certain ways, and and that that really has been making you feel a little bit disconnected from her, and that there is more of a type of relationship that you're wanting to have with her. Um, and you could even talk a little bit about, you know, how different the relationship is now, or what's missing would would be helpful. What what's been missing, or what are the ways that she's that she's kind of, you know, missing connecting with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, normally we have a wonderful relationship and we connect about all sorts of things and it's just like all of that is suddenly gone. And now all we talk about is, you know, like, what did you do today? Did you, where did you go? Who did you interact with? It's like this like interrogation of like, you know, the things that I did and what's my plan for tomorrow? Am I going to be leaving the house? And it's just, exhausting and it makes me sad because I don't, I used to look forward to our calls and now I don't look forward to them at all. So when you say it's a sad and irritating and exhausting like an interrogation but it also sounds like you you kind of feel like you you've lost your daughter a little bit you, you're maybe you miss her. Yes absolutely I do miss her very much we have such a wonderful relationship ordinarily and I wish I wish that she could relax a bit and not worry so much. And um, I mean, she of all people should know by now that no one can really make me do anything I don't want to do. So I'm sort yeah. of a bit surprised that she's trying so hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if there's one thing you'd you'd want to tell your daughter, what what would you want to tell her? I'd like, I'd like to tell her to relax and not worry so much. And I'd like to tell her that I, I want her back. I want our relationship back, our wonderful, close um, relationship. And that I miss her. I miss that. And... I want to tell her that, you know, if, if the worst happens and, you know, if I were to get the coronavirus and if I were to die, that she would be all right and, and that I, I would be all right. I, um, I'm not afraid of death. I'm totally comfortable with dying and I don't think she knows that. So, so, so you're, so you're not afraid of death. And, no, uh, but, I'm but, not. But what you are afraid of is, is the loss of life, the loss of your relationship. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. Um, and um, was there anything else that, that happened that, that Tuesday night that I'm trying to recreate here a little bit? Are there other questions I should be asking? Um, uh, Mary Ann, the, the mother. Zaina, I know that you felt that night several several shifts that happened and kind of moments of of um, really tears. seeing the, the tears and and seeing the world differently in a way. And we'll we'll talk more later after the role play about some of the details of that. But do you remember moments of being mom uh, now now that you are mom in this moment that that you could bring bring to life other parts that you saw. Um, I think that, I mean, I think we've covered the main ones. I think the one that was the most significant for me was really, um, my mom's total and complete comfort with death. And, um, that was a complete and utter shock to me. Because it sounds like, gonna... can I ask you a question? It sounds like, you know, Miriam, you're more afraid of the loss of connection and the loss of closeness with Zena than you are with dying. 
Is that true? Yes. Yes, that's completely true. I mean, I think, um, you know, if the, if let's say worst case scenario really did happen, um, and, and I were to die from the coronavirus, let's say at some point soon, um, well then even more of a reason that Zaina and I should be connecting now more than ever and savoring every day that we have and savoring every conversation that we have, um, rather than, you know, right now I feel like we're wasting it um, just Ar talking. Arguing. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, now more than ever we should be connecting and just enjoying sounds, and relishing. Sounds like your, your daughter is pretty kind of a special woman, special young woman. What, what are some of the things that you love about her the most? What are the most, some of the most beautiful things about your, your daughter? Oh gosh, she's, um, you know, she's, she's so lovely. She's the best daughter I could have ever asked for. I mean, it's funny because I, I made a joke earlier about how of all people um she should know that you know no one can really convince me to to do something that i don't want to do but but really i mean she's been the one person who could really kind of open my eyes to things that no one else would ever really be able to talk to me about like things where i was very kind of stubborn or like locked in a particular way of seeing something um, she knows how to talk to me. She knows when I'm really upset how to kind of bring me back down to earth and, you know, times where I've had conflicts with other people in our family. She's always trying to help me see their side and kind of bring us back together. And, um, she, yeah, I just, she's so smart and yet, and at the same time, she has such a good heart and she's so kind of motivated and accomplished and driven. I think, I think the only thing that I would kind of miss about dying is like, I just, I can't wait to see what she does. You know, she's done so many amazing things in her life and I think she's sort of just getting warmed up and I find that so exciting to watch. Sounds like she's a beautiful, loving, dynamic um young young woman a, a leader someone that you're just so proud of and so grateful to have as your daughter yeah yeah she's she's wonderful and i think i think we've both really um really stayed incredibly committed to our relationship you know there's there have been some tough times in our relationship over the years and i think we've both worked so hard at kind of staying connected and and working through those tough times when they've come up. Well, that's great, um, Mary. Um, uh, how, how, how good a job have I been, been doing at understanding how you're thinking and feeling? Oh, a wonderful job. You're really getting it. Yeah, great. So let's just uh, s stop here and, and say, what, what, what were we just doing? Why were we doing it? And what is the impact of it? What was the impact? And what happened after the session? But let's let's again, because it may be hard for listeners who have never heard of this technique to to grasp it. So can you summarize just briefly what we just did, uh, Zaina? Sure. Um, you want me to summarize what, like what we just covered? Yeah, just because people can get so easily confused and. Yes. Yes. So I think you know one thing to remember. Um, about this exercise, you know, I've, I've done this technique as a client um, a number of times and every You mean time. as a therapist? No, 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 experienced it as a oh, client. Oh, you've experienced it, yes. oh, okay. Yes, like this time where I was the client. Um, and I think the thing to remember about it, and that might be hard to understand just hearing about it, is you really sort of drop into this other person. And, you know, like David said, you're, you're trying to access both their conscious and subconscious. And um, whenever I experience this as a client, it really is like, you know, sort of Zena kind of disappears and I'm completely kind of in the role of um, my mother. And so, you know, often things that come up and th things that did come up when I did this were 
things that my mom were aware of that I had absolutely no conscious awareness of whatsoever. Um, and so I think really just being able to drop into that role and speak from um, my mother's perspective to the best of my ability is part of kind of the magic of this technique, at least in the way that I've experienced it. Why was that helpful or healing? And why did that bring tears to your eyes when you did it in the group 10 days ago? Well, I, I just had no idea that I didn't realize what I had been doing. I didn't realize that I was causing so much pain to my mother. I didn't realize the futility of trying to force her to be more cautious. Um, I didn't, it didn't occur to me that, you know, if she were to die, that I'm wasting the, the few, you know, days that or weeks that I could have left with her if she were to get sick with the coronavirus yeah. and die. Um, and then I had absolutely no idea whatsoever that she um, is comfortable with death um, at all because I, I don't, I'm a very spiritual person and, and by comparison, I don't consider my mom to be an extraordinarily spiritual person. So we don't have necessarily a lot of conversations about those types of things. And so I had just assumed incorrectly that she was not comfortable with death and was afraid of dying and that it would be this kind of terror-filled, awful experience. And I was completely wrong about that. One of, one of the um, points, I think, of, of this method or one of the magical things that happens is when you see, um, you know, the person who's flipped roles get surprised. And it, and it didn't surprise me just now, uh, Zaina, when you mentioned the, the idea of your mom being okay with, with dying during the role play and also here, because that was the huge moment for you that night. In fact, you hadn't considered that at all. You had a moment of epiphany while you were in her role. And you said, I don't even know if that's true. I don't know if that's right. I'm going to check it out with her. And then I think that you went and did that only to find out uh, that it was, it, it was true and that you'd kind of been missing something in a way. Right. That's exactly right. I, I asked my mom about her feelings about death and she, without any hesitation, she said, Oh, I'm completely comfortable with death. I'm not afraid of it at all. And I was, yeah, blown away both by the fact that she was complete, she is completely comfortable with death and also blown away that I somehow had that insight while doing this role play, even though she and I had never discussed it. And I yeah. was convinced that she wasn't comfortable with death consciously. Did that bring the two of you closer together? Absolutely. Now I feel like we, you know, we have this whole other dimension of experience in terms of spirituality that we can share and talk about um, because I was sort of misperceiving because she's not spiritual, maybe the way and I'm spirit, the way that I'm spiritual, I was missing out on seeing kind of her own spirituality. One of the teaching points that night was somebody quoted somebody who once said, the attempt to solve the problem is the cause of all relationship problems. The refusal to solve it is, is, is the solution. What, what does that mean? And who said that? Oh gosh, am I supposed to answer this? <laughs> well, you, you were trying to solve this problem with your mother that she's not being careful enough, right? Yes, yes. That's and you kept exactly trying right. to solve that problem. Yes. And you kept going around in circles. So that's what I mean by the attempt to solve the problem is the cause of all relationship problems. Right. Yeah, no, that's exactly what it was for me in this with my mom. And the refusal to solve the problem is the cure for all relationship problems. What, is, what does that mean? Well, it's, you know, it's like I was holding on so tightly to try to solve this problem and it was just making it worse. And when I could kind of let go and um, step back and realize that it's not really a problem, then the problem just sort of evaporates. Yeah, and um, and you can use the five secrets of effective uh, communication. One of our colleagues, Jeremy, who, who you know I, I love and greatly admire, his uh, his his fiance is working as, as a nurse, and so she's working you know in a hospital and in pretty dangerous circ circumstances. And he said that uh, 
she 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 wants to know how to to talk to patients. Some nurses have masks, some don't. And what what should I say? How how can we help our patients? And my answer to him was just she she can just just listen. Just ask them. Do you have any concerns? Are you upset? Do you have any any questions? And then rather than trying to solve the problem, just empathize, listen to what the other person is is thinking and and feeling, and provide warmth and support. But you don't have to do anything fancy uh, that that uh, you, you can give a lot in this the coronavirus era by giving nothing. Empathy is the nothing technique. You, you give nothing, you give zero, but you zero in on how the other person is thinking and feeling and encourage them to express their thoughts and feelings and provide warmth and support and, 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 and love if, uh, if, if appropriate. And uh, uh, that that that's that's going to go light years toward providing comfort and, and relief. We don't have to have all the solutions. We don't have to have all all, all the answers. And 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 what the, uh, the 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 forced empathy technique just allowed you suddenly to to see things through your mother's eyes rather than trying to get her to do something different or to behave differently. Uh, and then once that happened, suddenly the the love and and the closeness was there. It's a very simple message sadly it's it's hard for most people most of the time because we have the compulsion to help or to tell the other person what to do this is one of the most fundamental problems in in human relationships and uh, the five secrets of effective communication is is an amazingly powerful powerful tool and as i learned yesterday sometimes a hug is a just a powerful communication as well uh, and anything else, uh, Rhonda and Alex? David, can I make another point here that, that could be uh, maybe a reasonable teaching point? Um, it might be kind of a goofy way to look at it, but whenever we're in conflict, uh, there there seems to be at least four views that are kind of going on. And Zaina, when, when you were starting out in this, when you came, you said, I'm having this conflict with my mom and, and I want her to change. I want her to do something differently you had a view of her and you had a view of yourself and she had a view of you and a view of herself. You were seeing yourself as helpful and caring and cautious, responsible and loving. And you were seeing her potentially as kind of careless and indifferent and maybe stubborn. And then inside of this role just, play, just before you go on, let me summarize this because this is so well stated and so clear that Zaina was seeing her role in the relationship as to be helpful and uh, to, uh, kind of to save mother, to, to, to rescue mother. And, and uh, mother saw uh, Zaina's role, is that what, what, what we did next, as controlling no, or, just, or her own role? Is, Zaina was seeing her mom, she was seeing her mom as careless and indifferent and kind of stubborn. Oh yeah, that she yeah, yeah, thinking, right. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm right here and, and you're wrong. And this is how conflicts kind of go, you're thinking. Yeah. You know, I'm right and you're wrong, and, and the other, the other you're thinking they're wrong, they're wrong on the other side. But on the other side, they're thinking they're right and you're wrong. So there's a Grand Canyon between these two sets of of people, really. And so while you're thinking that you're caring and cautious, she's probably seeing you, your own words, maybe controlling and pressuring, kind of extreme and critical. And then you're seeing and insulting her in, in a way. Yes. It, yeah, exactly. And and you're seeing her as careless, indifferent, and stubborn, but she's seeing herself maybe as kind of reasonable and, and independent, careful enough, maybe comfortable with fate. That it's strong and courageous. Strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it's that, you know, conflicts persist when we stay fixed in our view of the world. You're seeing her as all bad and you as all good. And then this fundamental shift happens when we cross the divide to see the world or, or ourselves through the other person's eyes. And suddenly yeah. you, you saw yourself quite differently and, and her quite differently, I, I think maybe. So you're almost saying that uh, most, most but not all conflicts are really due to kind of a mutual uh, delusional system. <laughs> like we, we have this, zaina has got her role or, you know, we could all be Zana, we're just using you as an example, and you think you have this view of what's going on, and then mother has a radically different view of what's going on, and that's why you're 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 clashing and getting frustrated and angry and exasperated with each other. And then again, the idea is if you can 
if you're willing to get close, you have to be willing to, to get close. See, that's why it worked, because you love your mother and you wanted desperately to be close to her, even if that meant radically changing your understanding of the situation. And the moment you saw things through her eyes, then the tears came, the, the gentleness came into the system, and then you went out and it was just so easy to, to make that loving connection with, with your mom. Um, yes, absolutely. And Rhonda is now going to say some just, it wonderful seems like thing to wrap all of this up. <laughs> when we're in conflict, we're so myop myopic and seeing things uh, through our eyes and that we're correct. I love how Alex put that in the four um, yeah. roles. And we've talked about that before. The interpersonal downward arrow is another technique we use. I love how you did that so beautifully, Alex. And and seeing you know seeing the conflict from the other person's point of view, you know, just completely softens. Um, you know, uh, just you know, as you described it, saying it just really softened you and and made you feel much more tender toward your mother. And then you were able to go go have another conversation with her where you. The conversation was resolved and brought you closer and even in a spiritual way brought you closer. Yeah. And it, you know, it also, I think, worked at another level that was really powerful for me as well, which is that it made my anxiety around, you know, what she's doing or what she isn't doing in terms of how careful she's being. It made that pretty much disappear for the most part. That's awesome. Um, one last thing is uh, people listening to this probably partially got it, what we're trying to say. We try to make it simple and clear, but it's still hard to grasp these things and harder yet to put them into, into practical action. And so just a couple things to, to think about if you'd like to learn more about how to improve your relationships with people you love and care about. The, my book, Feeling Good Together, uh, is very inexpensive. You can pick it up on Amazon. You know, it's a paperback, uh, and there are written exercises to to really learn how how to master all of these techniques because it 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 is difficult to to learn to change the way you communicate when you're in conflict with with with, with somebody, but you can learn it if you're determined and if and if you practice. That would be one resource. And then another one is my summer intensive. I don't know yet 100% if it's gonna be canceled or if it's gonna happen, but it's summer and uh, when things warm up, you know, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that we'll be able to, to have it as a live event. And then we're gonna be having, uh, that's at the South San Francisco Conference Center. Uh, is, do, you, do you remember the dates of that, uh, Rhonda? Um, I and yes, I can look it up in about a second. It's, it's on my website with, with a link. But we'll have four days of practice with these communication techniques, the interpersonal downward arrow that Alex so masterfully demonstrated, the five secrets of effective communication, the three advanced secrets, for, forced empathy, uh, how to change the inner chatter when you're in conflict externally with someone. It's the first time we've had a, an intensive uh, co concentrating so much on, on these uh, co communication te techniques. It's August 10th through August 13th. Oh yeah, and that'll be at the South San Francisco Conference Center. And the uh, link for more information is on my website, feelinggood.com. One other resource is totally free of charge. If you go to my website, feelinggood.com and check on the, the uh, any, any of the links, say the, the podcast uh, link, then in the right-hand column, there's a search function. So let's say you wanted to get all the podcasts on, on five secrets of effective communication. You could just type that in and they'll all magically appear there. And, and it's kind of like you can create little courses and classes for yourself on, on any kind of topic, on, on suicide, on, on love and intimacy, on, on communication, on, on uh, you know, d depression, you know, all, all kinds of topics. There's, there's enormous resources there for you now. Any other closing words from? Uh, yeah, I'd really like to mention the, the Corona Clinic as a, as a closing 
Can I do that? Yeah, this is cool. I, we almost forgot it. This is also huge. This yeah. is another amazing new thing that Rhonda has helped to, to create along with my or cats and other colleagues at the Feeling Good Institute. Tell us what you're up to again. Well, the Feeling Good Institute has a nonprofit arm, which is called the Feeling Good Foundation. And the Feeling Good Foundation is sponsoring a Corona crisis clinic with another nonprofit. Um, and, and we're providing free crisis intervention therapy or free supportive therapy with high quality team CBT therapists. It, and it's for emergency medical staff in the Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. And um, you can learn more about it, but it's really exciting because those, the, the high quality team CBT therapy that we're providing, we're providing that free to the emergency medical staff. And we're hoping to expand it to other cities and other counties. You can find more about it if you Google um, or if you go to the website, feelinggoodfoundation.com. And if you are so inclined, you can make a donation to help us provide these kind of services to the, to the medical staff who are you know, working so diligently to keep our community safe. And if you're on the front line providing medical services and you're feeling grief, sadness, anxiety, and, and you need some uh, you know, high quality emotional support and, and team therapy, it's available absolutely free of charge for you. I think it's awesome what, what you and Moore and others are doing, uh, and Jill Levitt too. Uh, is it, it, it's, it's, I think gonna be a tremendous service to everyone. Well, thank you everybody for, t hmm. for tonight. It was a you know, David, wonderful I, experience, yeah. I realized I didn't mention my contact details when I introduce myself, would that be okay if I? Sure, and we'll also put them in the show notes, of course. Okay, perfect. Um, so if, if anyone wants to reach me for business owner entrepreneur coaching, um, my website is zainahaleen.com, which is spelled Z as in zebra, E as in elephant, I as in indigo, N is in November, A is in apple, H is in hotel, A is in apple, L is in laughter, I is in indigo, M is in mother. So zainahaleen.com. And if you want to reach me for psychotherapy, uh, you can go to the contact page of that website. That's there too. Yeah, that's awesome. So thank you everybody. And, uh, and thank you all for, for listening. Till next time. Thanks. Till next time. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.